sometimes I really, you know, a rainy Tuesday morning, you kind of wonder how many people are going to go, yeah, snooze, snooze, snooze. So, oh, thank you so much. Yes. So we're excited this morning to have our um, sponsor here this morning. One that's been here before is Thunderbolt Home Inspections. And so I'm going to let um, them introduce their team and talk about the services they can provide. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Keith Pope. Um, I'm the owner of Thunderbolt Home Inspection. This is my son, Ryan, who's also an inspector, or soon will be. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, I have another son who works for me. He's also an inspector. His name is Cody. Um, so we're here this morning just to introduce our company, ourselves, our philosophy about uh, home inspections and how we go about it and what's important to us when we look at a house. Um, I am a U.S. Navy veteran, seven years, got out in 1991, just after the first desert storm. Served on two carriers, um, Bachelor of Science in Electronics Engineering Technology, and an MBA. Um, I have over, this says 500 hours, it's much more than that now, um, in home inspection training. All of my experience in sales, field service, uh, customer service has been in technical fields. So with the engineering background and the technical background, um, I'm well suited to inspect the house and its systems. Um, my son Cody, who unfortunately can't be here with us today, um, Cody and I went through training for home inspection at the same time. Uh, we did our online training and our, and our field training together. Um, he currently is um, a captain with Houston Fire Department. Um, he achieved that in 10 years, which I find phenomenal. Um, so he, um, he, he's certified by um, AHIT, as I was. That's where I got my first certification. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with InterNACHI. It's the largest home inspection organization in the world. Um, and I'm a certified professional inspection, inspector with them. Hopefully Cody soon will be. Um, and my son Ryan recently uh, retired from the U.S. Army. Um, so he's, a, he's a, an Iraq vet. Um, and uh, he currently is going through his training, or just completed his training, and soon will take his test, soon as in hopefully next week. Um, I told him that it's probably one of the hardest tests he's ever going to take, but he won't listen, so we'll see. <laughs> nah, he'll do fine. So uh, we're glad to have Ryan on board as well. So it's a father, son, veterans and firefighters, first responder, own business. Uh, we wanted something that we could do together as father and sons, and so this is it. Um, a little bit about our philosophy. Obviously, we're going to look at that structure. You know, it's big for us. We, we call it, we, we sort of... Um, have a, a philosophy, what we call the three S's. Structure, systems, and safety. Um, we're going to look at that house, the structure of that house from top to bottom, from the ridge board to the foundation, everything in between, as much as we can see. Um, we're going to look for things that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some things that are not real big as, as far as uh, maybe prevent the sale of the house, but things the homeowner needs to know about so that when they move in, they can get those corrected and prevent bigger problems, hopefully, down the road. Okay? Um, systems, obviously, we're going to look at the HVAC systems, the plumbing, electrical, and all that sort of thing. We will fire the furnace, if possible, um, when possible, and, and look at the burners and everything. Um, doors and windows. Um, but one of our biggest things, our, our, my philosophy is, is, and hopefully I've imparted this to my sons, is a big thing about home ownership is safety. A lot of homeowners don't think about safety. I mean, obviously the, the standout things, you know, trip hazards and things like that, but there are some other sorts of issues um, with safety that they may not be aware of. And if we can bring that to their attention, when they move in, if they, if they give their attention to it, hopefully we can prevent someone getting hurt. So that's our philosophy with an inspection. Um, the other big thing, is because of my background, 25 years in sales and field service and customer service, that's real big for me, customer service. So your client is going to have a complete, full, 
computer re computer generated report, lots of pictures. Um, but more importantly, they're going to be satisfied with an explanation of everything that w that is in that report. If they don't understand it, we'll go back to the house, we'll show them, we'll talk to them about it, and make sure they understand what it means. It's very, very <coughs> important. Because, you know, if you're getting a 38-page report and you're about to buy a house, oh my, I'm not going to buy this house. But a lot of these things are not all that critical. Um, but we try to differentiate those in the report. Um, we also offer a free follow-up once they move into the house, if they would like us to come back. We'll go through the house with them and point out everything we found and our suggested way of, of mitigating that. So then that's, then that's free. Um, we've been asked quite a few times recently, do you do thermal inspections? Currently, I do not. I sold thermal cameras for 10 years. Um, but I will be we will be offering thermal imaging in our inspections within two weeks, probably. Um, because, in my opinion, you really have to know what you're doing, what you're looking at with that camera. That camera can be tricky. And it can, it can show you things, if you're not trained with it, that you may call out wrong. And then it could be a, you know, a deal breaker. What are you looking for with a thermal camera? Mostly we're looking for cool spots. Okay. So bad insulation issues. That that would be that would be uh, an example of a hot spot. Okay. Okay. But why is it there? Okay. It, right. The the heater vent may be blowing right uh, there on right. the ceiling, right? Okay. So we have to investigate that. When I say cool spots, um, we're looking for areas where the temperature differential between, say, the wall and that corner, that corner may be 15 or 20 degrees cooler. Well, why would it be cooler? Water. Ah. Water. So that's really what we're looking for. Okay. It's well, water. The difference in the room, you might have an air conditioned room on that side. And you're exactly you right. Might not be one you're of exactly here. right. You're, and that's what I mean about being trained in what you're looking at and investigating what that picture means to you. Right? It may not. It may not be a problem, but you have to find out. So you can't just rely on that thermal camera to give you the information. You have to follow it up with some other type of instrument, whether it be a moisture meter or you know, some other type of, of instrument that we have in our bag to tell you what that means. So that is Thunderbolt Home Inspection. Hopefully, um, hopefully soon. All of you will call my office <laughs> <laughs> to schedule your inspection, um, and, we, and we would love, you know, obviously we'd love that to happen. So, yes, sir. Plus per square feet. Uh, we start out at 325. That's 2,000 square feet or less, 20 years old or less. For every 500 square feet above 2,000, it's 25 dollars. Do you do uh, pool and termite, or is that something you do? I do pool and spa. I don't do termite yet. But I have a guy that, that will come out during my inspection while I'm there and do the termite <coughs> inspection. So it's still just one phone call and one inspection. Yes, sir? What about mold? Do not do mold. Don't do mold? Yet. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I didn't mention Thunderbolt is only a year old. I started about this time last year. Um, great timing on my part, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, not only was it a challenge to, to get take our test with Trek because of Harvey, right. but then the whole, you know, obviously the whole real estate market was in turmoil at that time. So uh, it took us a while, but we survived that, and uh, hopefully we're going to survive our next year. Um, you know, I keep hearing that it takes two years, 18 months, two years, two and a half years. I'm like, okay, well, we're halfway there. That's right. <laughs> so keep plugging away. Well, your ace of the hole is the free inspection that you come back for. That's What's the ace of the hole. The free inspection that you come back for after. The explanation, the I customer mean, service follow-up, yeah, right. that's, that's your... That's your ace of the hole. Yeah, that's, that's, really, a, that's a very nice service. Yeah. I haven't even talked about the discounts yet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right, yeah. <laughs> I guess that's um, my part. Yeah, since, since you brought it up. <laughs> so being, being a veteran first responder, own and operated company, we want to honor those people. So veterans, first responders, educators, government employees, 
uh, first time home buyers, 10% off guaranteed. However, if they choose to do a 11th month inspection with us, they agree to it, we'll give them 20% off that first inspection and 10% off their 11th month warranty inspection. So we'll come out there, we'll tell them when it is, we'll give them a call before that, we'll go out there and inspect the house. That way they can call their builder or whoever it was and say, hey, this needs to be fixed. Because correct, correct me if I'm wrong, when, when a home warranty is sold, whether or not it's a new house, um, that typically is a year long, right? That's yes, right. Okay. So that's, the, that's our 11 month warranty inspection. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know, I, I'm not going to talk about other inspectors, but what we'll do is that warranty inspection is another full inspection on that house. So we're not going to just look at the appliances. We're going to do the same inspection we did before. So. Good. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you, and thank you for breakfast. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Mr. Reyes. Let you come up. Yeah, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to everyone, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. Morning guys, how are you? Morning. Great, yeah. <coughs> I was thinking about something the other day um, on uh, how great you guys have it here with MCAT. I was really <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was going to go a different way. <laughs> I got a file that I was looking at and it kind of kind of jarred that, that memory and that thinking. A long time ago, I used to do home sales. And I remember uh, selling houses and you know being uh, at, at the mercy of the underwriters and the, the people that were doing the financing part. And uh, you know, remembering that there was no, no flexibility. I mean, basically, you were at their mercy. If, if the customer came in and they had everything they had to get the loan done, the loan was done, and they didn't, I mean, that was it. I mean, it kind of ended there. And so, so I got this guy, a real life person, that I got the other day. And uh, it's a guy that I brought with me uh, since I moved here. So I've got a lot of files like that that I, you know, I've had for six months, nine months, and they're slowly trickling in and, and, and getting to be. But this guy, he really surprised me. His name uh, is, he's got a first name and a last name that are the same. It's Felix Felix. <laughs> I almost couldn't believe it when I first saw it, but um, it, 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 it is true. <laughs> he's, a, he's a Border Patrol guy. He's been, in the, been uh, with the Border Patrol for 19 years. So he's got great job stability. Uh, super busy, hard to get a hold of. But anyway, to make a long story short, uh, when I first saw him, he had a 720 score. And something other than credit is what didn't allow him to go through it. When I got him the second time around, this score was a 572. Hmm. How many people are getting loans done with scores under 580? Not many. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's pretty much how it is. Uh, one of the things that AMCAP does is uh, they do in-house financing. Did, they, did you guys know that? No. Mm -hmm. okay. they, they do in-house financing. So, so basically, this guy, I kind of, when I pulled the credit report and I was reviewing the history and all that stuff, I kind of, you know, like we all would do is, I would raise an eyebrow and I was like, well, you know, another one bites the dust kind of deal, you know? <laughs> but uh, did some further digging and um, made some phone calls and come to find out that this is a deal that I can get done. I was a little surprised too. And I said, okay, well, there's got to be a catch. I mean, you know, what, what, what do I need to do to get, be able to get this deal done? And to my surprise, I mean, you know, at a 572, if I had a 572 and someone was telling me, hey, listen, I can get this deal done, I would be ecstatic. Uh, and I was even more ecstatic when I found out the minimum overlays <coughs> that MCAT requires. Uh, you know, I was talking to a, a couple of underwriters and she's saying, hey, listen, uh, take a look at his payment shock. Uh, does anybody know what payment shock is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever you pay versus whatever you want to pay. Yeah, rent. good. So if, if you're renting and you're renting for a thousand bucks and your new house payment is $1,800, well, there's a little payment shock <laughs> there. <laughs> 
So, so I, I want to just go over just a, a couple of things that they look at, and they're minimal. I mean, one is payment shock. You know, we've got to make sure that they're not in shock, <laughs> coma, or something. One of the things that she was looking at, she said, hey, see if you can beef them up a little bit, you know? See if you can kind of look at a 401k, look at any maybe uh, investments that he may have, uh, to kind of get them looking a little bit better on paper, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, keep an eye on this DTI. We can go even at a 572, as high as 45 on the debt to income ratio. So I thought that was that was good. Uh, you know, they'll do a verification of rent to make sure that, of course, that he's paid satisfactory. And then uh, they want the customer to do a, a letter of explanation as to, uh, in this, in his credit profile, it was clear that he had a a time period that he struggled. Something happened in that time frame. So a letter of explanation, just kind of explaining it, you know, in your own terms, mm -hmm. what happened. Um, and that's kind of basically it. You know, so we got a guy that's got a 572 score. We want a little history. You know, we're not making them jump through hoops. But this is a deal that we can get done. So if I was on that end, where you guys are, uh, you're very lucky to have a company that, one, has in-house financing, one, that's going to take the extra step to make sure that all the things get done, so you get an extra deal that you normally wouldn't have had. So if you're thinking of going outside or, you know, your friend's friend or whatever, you know, give it a, give it a little fight, you know. See if you can keep them in-house, because I know we can do a good job once they get here. But I thought that was very interesting. I thought I'd share that with you guys. So uh, keep those in mind. Great. Right, thank you. OK. So um, as promised, today we're going to go over some market statistics, <coughs> things that have taken place um, over the last two years on a monthly basis. Um, we've had an interesting year, haven't we? Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, just think of where we were this time last year, even holding team meetings or trying to get to the office or, or what we were talking about. It was um, an interesting time uh, 12 months ago. And we're so thankful that you know a lot of our agents have been able to recover from their business or get back into their homes. We had dinner with friends last night who had 18 inches of their house in 94 and had four and a half feet um, in, a year ago. And um, she was able to cook breakfast this past weekend in her kitchen for the first wow. time. So um, kind of um, uh, an opportunity to celebrate. And they actually moved into their bedroom, I think, Friday night. Uh, because which, whatever the one-year anniversary was, they, were, they moved back into their master bedroom. Even though all the furniture wasn't quite in, um, they just felt that they had to be back in their master bedroom within a year. So kind of exciting times for them and, and an opportunity to celebrate the recovery. All right, so what I have for you guys this morning is um, some of the typical reports that we look at. And I'll let you pass those out and I'm in a few more copies. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know you don't have one in front of you, but maybe if people could look on with each other, we'll make sure everybody gets one before you leave um, today so that you have this information. And we'll also be posting it on k to connect um, in color, so if you wanted to download it and use it in, in anything that you're doing, you can do that. How many of you are following me on KW Connect? Oh, wow. All right, you know how to follow people on KW Connect? A lot of the new ones should be. All right, so you go to KW Connect, and in the search button, you just put the name of the person you want to follow, and it comes up, and you click on them and say, follow that person. And the reason you want to do that so that anytime I post something, or Matt posts something, or Valerie posts something, or Pam posts something, then you get an email notification that something's been posted by someone you follow. Um, the information from last week, um, Kathy's um, tech tips. I posted her entire presentation on KB Connect. Did y'all know that? Yep. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people were up here taking pictures of the screens. It's all on KW Connect so that you can easily look at it and pull it down whenever you need that. And of course, in a much better format 
than your phone. All right? I've been following people and didn't even know about it. Well, there you go. Good job. All right. So what we're going to start with is area one. So I, I wrote that down here in the bottom where it says area one in the bottom left corner. For those that are new to the business, area one is what we call the humble Atascacita market. So it's kind of south of the river, which is just north of us here, going all the way down to the Beltway, east on the other side of Lake Houston, so it includes some Huffman and a little bit of Crosby over there, and then it goes west um, kind of to, I don't know what would you say is west, all, not all the way to Alding Westfield, but it's more like um, the airport, kind of the airport there is kind of, the, what's the park of the yeah. Jesse Jones? Jesse or, Jones yeah. Park. Yeah, that's kind of the, Kenswick. the yeah, Kenswick is probably a good um, a Kenswick park. Kenswick is 12. That's 12. Yeah, well, that's then 12. maybe a little further this Just side of Kenswick. Yeah. 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 So the mall, the back side of the mall, yeah. kind of those areas. So that's that's area one. So when you're in the MLS and you're searching area one, that's what you're getting. So what I've got for you is the first several pages are, are a complete overview of that market. So the first thing that you see is the median price. So what's the definition of median? Middle. The middle. So it's right smack in the middle of half the property sold for more than that and half the property sold for less than that. So you'll see that over the last two years, going back to August of 2017, the median price in Area 1 has increased 20%. Is that exciting news? That's really good news for some people that maybe bought houses a couple of years ago, right? Behind that, and on page three is the average price per square foot, which a lot of people kind of like to hear. They kind of like to maybe take the average price per square foot against their number and see if they can't estimate uh, what their price might be. And it's gone up 8%, which is kind of a nice number. 4% a year is kind of a good uh, appreciation for our homes um, in any neighborhood. So not crazy numbers, but a good solid increase over the last two years. All right. Behind that, you've got what we call the uh, supply and demand report. So it shows you the, the, the big line in each one of those columns is the number of homes on the market. The next line to, next to it, I know yours isn't in color, is what's called under contract or pending. And then the final, the third line, are the sold transactions. So compared to a year ago, there are 3.7 fewer homes on the market. There are 7.5% more homes under contract, and there were 13% fewer units sold compared to August of 2016. Now, on the back of each one of your pages is really the month-by-month -month numbers. So if you really wanted to go back to a specific month and look at numbers, you could. All right, and then behind that is what we call the month supply of inventory. So that means that if not another home went on the market, based on the most recent sales transaction information, how long would the inventory last? So if the number of sales stayed at the same rate, but nobody else listed their house and it, and it, it extinguished the supply, how many months would it take for that to happen? So for the month of August, it is down to 2.8 months, less than three months worth of inventory in Area 1. Now I know there's that big slop in 17.3% down, which sounds terrible, but two years ago it was 3.4 months. Mm -hmm. Still a very tight market. And what's the definition of a balanced market? Six months. Six months of inventory. So anything less than six is considered to be a seller's market. Anything <coughs> over six is considered to be a buyer's market and kind of in the 6% the, the range is what we call a balanced market, all right? So then I took that same area and divided it into price points. And I only gave you two charts on each one of the price points. So the first price point, and we're on, on page nine of the chart, is showing you the zero to $250,000 prices, okay? So the um, number of homes on the market is down 20%. There are currently only six, uh, 515 homes on the market in that price point. Two years ago, there were 647. So buyers have fewer choices than they did two years mm -hmm. ago. The number of homes sold is also down. It's down to 169 units that closed in August compared to 218 units that closed two years ago. Behind that, you've got the month supply of inventory for that price point. 
and it's down to a month and a half. So if you've got a zero to two hundred fifty thousand dollar seller, what conversation should you be having with them? Where do you plan to move? Uh, right? Because <laughs> if we price it right and it's in great condition, more than likely it should sell pretty quickly. So there, they need to have a plan. Where do you plan to go to? All right. All right. So then I bumped up the price point. So I'm now to page 13. And we're going to 250 to 350. So $100,000 price bucket, 250 to 350. And you'll see that the homes, um, the, the inventory of homes at that price point is up by 23.8% compared to two years ago. We're up to nearly 350 units on the market. Good news is more of those homes sold too. Uh, a 12.5% increase. Two years ago, only 56 homes in that price point closed. Last month, 63 closed. And then finally, you've got the month supply of inventory for that 250 to 350 price point, and it's down 48%. Um, it was um, nine months of inventory two years ago, and it's down to five months now. All right. All right. And then I've got two more price buckets for you. The next price bucket for area one is the 350 to $500,000 price point. Month supply, or the number of homes on the market is up 17%. There's now 166 homes on the market in that price point compared to 142. Good news was 20 of those homes sold last month um, compared to only 14 two, month, two years ago. So that, I think that's pretty encouraging uh, for that price point, for there to be uh, that big of an increase in number of homes sold. All right, and then the month supply of inventory has uh, gone down from nearly um, 10 months down to right at a six month inventory. So if you've got a listing in the three hundred fifty dollars to $500,000 house, <coughs> and they don't understand why friends of theirs who had a $300,000 house got an offer quicker than them, this is the chart you show them, okay? They're in a price point where there's fewer buyers and there's more competition. And then finally, kind of what I would maybe we call the luxury market um, over 500,000 is going to be your next couple of charts. Um, there's just slightly fewer more homes on the market. There were 58 two years ago, now there's only 62. And only three homes sold during the month two years ago and four sold last month. So once again, if you've got a, a listing in that over $500,000 price point, you need to share with them that only four buyers made a decision to purchase in that price point last month. And it's, you know, it's, it's not them. <laughs> It's just that for whatever reason, buyers made a, a different selection. And they've got a lot to choose from, right? Mm -hmm. Now that's a big, you know, over 500,000, that's a lot of different homes. But we don't have too many million dollar price point homes in that area one. What you think, Susan? It's very few. I would say most of them are in that five, six, seven, maybe up to seven, right? And then the month supply of inventory for area, um, one has gone up slightly, <laughs> nearly doubled. It went from 12 months of inventory two years ago to 25 months, um, nearly a two-year supply of inventory um, this past month. So again, people in that price point, unless they're priced aggressively and their house is in excellent condition, um, it's not going to be something that sells really, really fast, on average. All right, so what's your ahas for area one? Somebody give me an aha. The high end of the oversupply. Oversupply in the over five hundred thousand dollar price point. What else? Hot market. Hot market for what price point? Less than two fifty. Less than two fifty. Yeah. And is it a still a good market in that kind of sweet spot, that two fifty to three fifty range? Yeah. The twenty percent increase in price. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's another great one. The, the fact that the median price point went up pretty significantly over two years. And average price per square foot is an 8% over a two year time period. So, um, you know, a lot of people got upset with their taxes this past April, right? And they need to know that that's, that the, the state knows, the county knows what's happening with prices. So um, that, that's unfortunately the way our tax base works here in Texas. It's all based on property values. 
and um, certainly you can help them, give them some information to help them go in and possibly um, fight those or protest those. But <coughs> that's the next one. All right, so now let's do area 32. And there are more copies coming, so I've got. So area 32 for our newest agents or guests is what we call kind of Kingwood proper. It's the original Kingwood development. It's not including some of the Kingwood expansion that took place over time, like over on this side of the, of the river, um, Kings River and Kingwood Glen. Those are still considered Area 1, although they were a Kingwood development. They weren't a part of the original Kingwood development. They were acquired later. Oakhurst was not a part of the original Kingwood development. It was acquired later. And it's, um, we'll, we'll talk about that report here in a minute. So it's um, the Harris County portion north of the river. So the Harris County line is kind of the dividing line. Humble Independent School District there on the north side is all Area 32. So that kind of helps you um, see the definition. We've got maps up around the office. You can always see where those dividing lines are for Area 1 and Area 32. Most all of Area 1 and Area 32 are all Humble ISD, except for things on the east side of the river, which become Huffman and Crosby. Make sense? Does that kind of help you? All right, so we're looking at the same reports for Area 32. We've got um, the medium price. It has gone up from 230000 to 248000 over two years, and that's a 7.8% 7 7 increase. Well, this is the medium price. Now let's look at price per square foot, which is the next one. So average price per square foot has only oh, wow. gone up right at 5%. And what was area one? Eight. Eight. Now what do you think? Harvey. 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 Why Harvey? Because you couldn't sell it. Couldn't sell it? I don't know. Well, people were nervous. And other people, a lot of people were they wasn't right and they people say to them, they're so cheap. Okay, so people ended up just selling as is, as is mm -hmm. right? So a house that probably should have sold for $130 a square foot may be sold for $70 a square foot, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to hurt those averages, right? So you need to help your clients understand that in Area 32, probably there were more homes that flooded versus Area 1. We had some over here, right? Mm -hmm. Along Kings River and behind <coughs> the shores and, and over in Walden. Um, lots of homes got water in them, and people ended up selling them after they were mucked out and sold them as is because they had their insurance. They took their insurance and sold it as is and took their insurance and their proceeds and, and moved on to something else. Same thing happened in Area 32, probably at a larger um, number. Now, what was the average price point of homes in Kingwood that flooded? If I want to take a guess, I don't know the number. I'm just asking. Ten to twelve percent. What? Ten to twelve percent. No, the average price point. Sorry, three hundred. Four hundred. Four hundred is a good number. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Four hundred is a good number. Because when you look at the neighborhoods that flooded, Barrington, Kingwood Greens, the Enclave, Foster's Mill Estates, uh, the Point out at, at, at Kings Point. You know, those are all really nice homes, right? That on average would sell anywhere from, you know, 350 and up, right? So those people that ended up taking a buyout or sold as is really did kind of hurt the comps from an overall standpoint, right? Now, certainly when you're doing comps and you're helping someone price their homes, you can pick out the houses in a neighborhood that flooded or didn't flood or sold as is or sold as improved. You can help your clients understand that. So be cautious when you kind of throw these numbers out that you don't sit here and say, well, the Kingwood market sucks because it only went up this number, right? Because that's an average number, okay? All right, so average price per square foot went up just 5% over a two-year time period. Supply and demand on page five uh, shows that the number of homes on the market has gone up uh, to 526 units, that's a 15% increase, and a 16% reduction in the number of homes sold compared to two years ago. 107 units sold last month compared to 128 two years ago under contract, kind of stayed flat. And then the month supply of inventory has gone up from 3.1 months to 4 months. 
So it's still a, a, a seller's market to an extent, but it's trending towards a balanced market, right? Okay. All right, then we're going to do the price bucket. So 0 to 250 on page 9 um, shows that the number of homes on the market is about the same as it was two years ago. Um, it's down to 188 units. Um, but the number of properties sold in that price point is down 17%. Um, there were 70 homes sold in that price point two years ago compared to only 58 this past month. Anything else? 50 years? So Tatiana is asking why is it down? Because that's a great price point, right? Anybody, got a, anybody have a buyer that's in that 0 to 250 range in Kingwood? And you're looking at houses? Why do you think it's down? Oh, new construction. New construction? There's really not any new construction that competing at that price point. They're really picky. They're yes. picky. And I'm going to say that probably the ones that are on the market in that price point are overpriced. Yes. They're really pushing the envelope, and buyers are a little bit more savvy. Now, most of those homes didn't flood, right? So they don't have to worry about flooding, because that's not the neighborhoods that flooded. But I think that sellers are really being aggressive in their pricing, and buyers are probably rejecting the price more than anything else. All right, and then you've got your month supply of inventory on page 11. Um, has stayed about the same. It was 1.9 months two years ago, and it's just slightly over two months this time um, last month. All right, next price point on page 13 is the um, 250 to 350. 38% more homes on the market. There's 173 units on the market now compared to 125 two years ago. And uh, just a few less homes sold compared to a year ago. Uh, what was that? Nine houses fewer sold in August of 2018 compared to August of 2016. So once again, I'm thinking there's some sellers in that price point that are probably not priced correctly. Right. And then, finally, month supply of inventory has gone from three and a half months up to 5.2 months. All right. So if you have a seller in that 250 to 350 range, to me, that's the, st the statistic I would give them today. Two years ago, I know you had friends that sold their house really quickly two years ago, but today there's nearly six months worth of inventory in your price point. So, Mr. Seller, in order for your house to be the next home to sell in the neighborhood, what do you suggest we do? Price it. Just price it. Or maybe they take uh, uh, your advice on, you know, painting over that burnt orange they've got everywhere. Because <laughs> <laughs> I nearly lost the this <laughs> Too bad they did. Okay. All right. And then you've got the next price point, the three fifty dollars to $500,000 price point on page 17. Uh, this has gone up 24% from 82 to 120. 102, 20 more homes on the market in that price point compared to two years ago. About the same under contract, but great news. 20 homes <coughs> sold in that price point this past August compared to August two years ago. <coughs> Now, I'm going to say that more than likely, there's some homes that have hit the market compared to two years ago that are rehab homes in that price point. Anybody else agree? And I drive through, I don't drive through a lot of neighborhoods, but I drove through the Enclave one day. It was kind of early for an appointment. I thought, I'm going to take a tour through the patio homes, you know, kind of back behind Randall's, back in that neighborhood. And just see how the neighborhood's looking, how many more dumpsters are there in the driveways. And it's kind of cleaned up. I mean, there's a few houses you kind of notice that they still are working on them, but there are a lot of homes on the market in that neighborhood, and very few of them are listed by local brokerages. So what is that an indication of? Investors. Investors that came in and bought out the homeowner who said, I had flood insurance, I'll take your $150,000, i will put it with my two fifty dollars that I'm getting from FEMA, and I'm moving on, right? And then the investor went in there and spent a hundred thousand on it, so he's now at a two fifty price point. And what's he listing it for? Three eighty, yeah. right? So probably not 
doing himself any favors. They can, they can really cash in on a great neighborhood, but again, they probably haven't done the right renovations, and of course, they've overpriced themselves. So there were a few homes in that neighborhood that flooded in um, 2004, but very few. But every home in that neighborhood, 2004, we had um, the rain for. No, it wasn't one, right? When did 2000? No, 1994. Not 2004. 1994 was the last time that area flooded. And there were just a few homes that flooded at that time. But in, in Harvey, every home in that neighborhood flooded. I got a question. Yeah. I don't know why I can't. I can't. So the enclave is a patio homes. Back over at Kingwood Place. Right behind the three story. Behind you know where? Um, behind Miranda Lake. Chick fil A. So you go, you're going down Westlake Houston Parkway and you cross the bridge, and it's the second light that you come to. You take a right, that right. road kind of curves around and hits yeah. Kingwood Drive. All those saying. patio homes to your right. Isn't that the Enclave? Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. They're, not, they're not nice homes, are they? Those are patio yeah. homes. Very nice yes. patio homes. It's location, location, location. <laughs> most all of them are, there were a few village builder homes, patio homes in there, but they were all done very well, and most of the people in there had done some really nice things. <laughs> yeah. uh, what about the homes, you know, the homes were flooded, and this, this was the uh, most water anyone's ever had, so right. I've been here for 50 years, and, and uh, the homes that flooded, now the homes that did not flood, uh, what about to sell them, because they, they don't sell as fast, or... or uh, <coughs> I think there would definitely be buyers who don't want to buy a house that ever flooded, okay? And then there's going to be people that will buy a house in Kingwood because they want to live in Kingwood. They want their kids to go to a specific school, or they want to be an humble ISD, or they want to be close to family. I don't know that, you know, I know there were some sellers that made mistakes going, well, my house didn't flood, so therefore I'm going up in price. You really just need to price your home competitively. And there's not going to be that big of a jump in in homes that didn't flood as far as price point. So I've talked to a few of the people in there, and they, uh, they're kind of worried about, you know, the, how the flood prices would affect their homes and if they would lose value. Yeah, so there's a, mis there's a misnomer out there that people think that because I didn't flood in a neighborhood, but a lot of the homes in my neighborhood did flood, and they sold for less price, now my value went down. Most appraisers are looking at what the value of the home was prior to the flood. I, I, yeah, or they're looking at other homes that didn't flood. They're trying their best to pull homes that are as comparable as possible to that. I did a, a bunch of uh, repeals last year for, for that area. Mm -hmm. And the lenders, they did not allow me to use uh, flood right. prices. It has to be like a regular market. Yeah. Can I go over page 17 already? Yes. All right. Yes. Page, eight, page 19 is the month supply of inventory. For the 350 to 500 is now up to eight and a half months worth of inventory. All right, last price point for um, area 32 is going to be the over $500,000 price point. The number of homes on the market is about the same as it was two years ago. Um, the number of homes under contract has gone up slightly. Um, and the number of homes sold went from 11 homes in August of 2016 down to seven homes that sold this past month, okay? That was on page 21. And then the month supply of inventory um, has actually gone down slightly from 13 months to 8.1. The good news there for that over $500,000 price point. Are these all right. resale? Or resale? These are all resale. Okay. Yeah, I did not include any new construction in here because I didn't want to skew it because I can really... Do you have a feel for... What kind of shadow inventory is still out there as far as uh, homes still looking to be rehabbed? There is there a feel for that? I have a feeling that the investor product has all hit the market. Right. And I have a feeling there's people that didn't have insurance that have gotten loans, SBA loans, or pulled money out of savings to do their renovation and are still living and have made the decision to stay in their house, but probably for a short term. Or they couldn't compete with a total rehab either. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. yeah. All right, so this is what I call East Montgomery County. Which, 
So I don't do this by MLS area because MLS area that covers this, these neighborhoods is what's called Area 40. And if you look at the MLS map, Area 40 goes as far west as Harmony and Bender's Landing and kind of picks up more of a Woodlands product over on that south Woodlands Highway 99 area. So I do this one by zip codes. So I pulled this report for Porter, New Caney, and Splendora, those three zip codes that cover Porter, New Caney, um, and Splendora. So starting at the front of Kingwood, Oakhurst, Kings Manor, and going north all the way up to Tavola. Right? Now, of course, anything in Tavola would only be resale if it made these reports because I did not include any new construction. Right? So, for East Montgomery County, the median price has gone up 20.8% over a two-year time period. It was $167,000 two years ago, and now it's up over $205,000. Pretty nice. Anybody live in East Montgomery? Anybody one of those zip codes? Yeah, there's some people happy now. Now, you don't have that money until you sell it, right? <laughs> All right, average price per square foot has gone up 8.6%. Um, so the numbers are kind of looking like area yeah. one, aren't they? 20% yeah. increase in average and median price, over 8% increase in average price per square foot. <laughs> and then you've got the um, supply and demand report, and this is the entire market, all price points. Um, number of homes on the market is down 9.2%. <coughs> Under contract is down slightly uh, from 66 to 61. But look at the sold. 20 more units sold in August of 2018 compared to August of 2016 in one of those three zip codes. And then your month supply of inventory has gone uh, kind of state stable. 3.8 months two years ago to 3.7. So a very slight change in the month supply of inventory. So now we can look at the price points, the price buckets, zero to 250. The inventory's gone down 20%, 50 fewer homes on the market compared to uh, uh, two years ago. Um, and the number of homes closed um, has gone up just slightly from 39 units two years ago to 44 <coughs> units this past August. Behind that, you've got the month supply of inventory for the 0 to 250, 2.4 months. So a very tight market, uh, a very strong seller's market as far as sellers being able to hopefully get the price they want and negotiate the terms that they'd like to see on the contract. Next price point on page 13 is the 250 to 350 range. Um, not much change in the inventory. It's about the same. Um, number of homes under contract is, is about the same, but the number of homes under that have sold uh, went up pretty significantly. Only 10 houses sold two years ago in that price point, and 17 closed this past month. So nearly double. And then the month supply of inventory on page 15 has gone from 4.6 to 5.4. So not much of a change, slight change. All right, next price point is the 350 to 500 on page 17. 22% uh, more homes on the market, which means nine. That sounds like 22% sounds like a lot, right? Yeah. Nine more houses, which isn't um, significant. Um, and about the same number under contract, but look at the sold. Yeah. Only two <laughs> homes sold in that price point two years ago, and 11 closed last month. Wow. Nice. And then the month supply of inventory um, has gone from 16 and a half months to 20.5. All right, supply and demand for the over $500,000 price point. There's not much. Um, there's 21 homes on the market. Two are under contract and not a single closing in that price point last month. So it's um, no data for that sold data. And then the month supply of inventory um, has gone down from 18. It was 18 two years ago. It was only 7.5 this past month. All right, I've got one more report to share with you, and then I've got some notes that I took um, at a meeting that I was at yesterday. So um, I want to go over that information with you. And I did not make two copies of this, but we can shoot some of these. So this is what we call the um, trends report for Keller Williams. So I get this report, I think I got it maybe Friday or Monday from Keller Williams. And what they do is they look at certain 
um, matrix uh, as far as the offices are concerned and, and see how we performed compared to the same month a year ago and then year to date compared to year to date, okay? If it's green, it's an over 10% improvement. If it's pink, it was less than 10%. Okay? So, we like to see lots of green. All right. So, you can see that for Keller Williams, um, we were at um, just a couple of categories where the overall company improved for the month of August compared to the month of August a year ago. Listings taken, volume, and expenses. Now expenses, if it's less than 10%, it's green. If it's over 10%, it's pink, so it's reversed, okay? Because you want to keep your expenses down, right? Whereas the South Texas region was green in every category for the month of August except for expenses. They were just up slightly at 11.7%. All the Keller Williams offices in Houston were primarily green in every category for the month over month, um, except they didn't have the number for appointments, and of course expenses were high. And then you look for our look at our office, our listings taken volume was just almost green. It was 9.2%. Um, our expenses were higher than they were the year prior, um, and our appointments and our net were down compared to August of 2016 compared to August of 2018. But here's what I want to share with you is that in the month of August, you guys broke an all-time record in closed volume. Our previous number had been in June of 2017 of 49 point something, 49 point something million dollars in closed volume uh, for the month. Last month, you closed over 50 million dollars worth of real estate. Give yourself a Here's the other cool number, gross commission income. So this is all the commission that was earned on that 50 million was again an all-time high for a month. It was over 1.4 million dollars worth of commission that was earned by the agents in this office last month. An all-time high for our agents. So, you know, there's lots of times throughout 2018 that I was kind of going, eh, well, are we back? Is it coming back? Is it going to be the same? Is it going to be worse? You know, how are things going? And I'm feeling pretty good at this point. Yeah. Um, I think we've, we, as far as an overall market, we have survived a major storm better than any other market in the United States over the history of them tracking this information. So I think that just shows the resiliency of the Houston um, market. Uh, the resiliency of the people that live in Houston, yes. and of course the strong um, employment and, and economic drivers that are coming uh, through Houston. So here's some numbers that I got yesterday in a meeting that I was at. I was at the Texas Association of Realtors Board of Directors meeting, and they had Dr. Gaines speak. And if y'all ever heard Dr. Gaines talk before, he is the director of the Texas Real Estate Center at Texas A&M University. Woo! So um, he's really fun. Yeah, you know, for an economist, he. Um, you know, is not that dry. He's got some funny things to say. He makes it fun, so it's kind of interesting to watch. So I took some notes and I, I tried to type them up so that you didn't have to read my notes, so you could see some of the information. So here are some of the notes that I wrote down, and this is overall for the, the entire nation. That we've got record GDP, gross domestic product expansion, has gone from it's at, it's in the two and a half to three percent range. Um, that's really good when we have GDP that's um, increasing um, at that rate. Um, interest rates are up, but here's the other thing that he pointed out about interest rates. He said that in 2006, which was kind of the last really boom year for um, Texas real estate, what were interest rates in 2006? David, you remember? Six point something. Six point five. They were in the sixes, right? Are they in the sixes now? No. Did people still buy houses back in 2006? Yes. And it was record numbers, okay? So even though interest rates are up now just slightly to four and a half, maybe four and three quarters, they're still historically low interest rates. Uh, job, um, has, jobs have expanded from one and a half to two percent, or in that range they're expanding at one and a half to two percent, and unemployment is down. We all see those numbers. We always hear about unemployment being down, but jobs, that's actually job creation. More people adding a position um, at their offices or their companies. Inflation is up. Um, it's in the two to two and a half percent range. And, the, and it could be higher, 
But what's keeping it, uh, they're trying to keep it tampered a little bit, is that the Fed keeps you know, upping interest rates to kind of cool it down just a tad. Um, the impact of the tax um, cuts, um, income tax uh, changes that were made earlier this year are mixed. There are some people that are feeling really good about that. There are some people that are not feeling so good about that. So it's kind of a mixed reaction as far as whether or not there will be a, a big economic um, change from the tax cuts. I know for me personally, I kind of have to wait and see. You know, I haven't filed. I mean, although the rates went down for 2018, has anybody filed their 2018 tax return yet? I don't really don't know, you know if it was good or bad for me until I actually get into uh, filing those taxes. Now, industrial production is at a, at a new high. Household debt is rapidly increasing. Is that good or bad? Bad. It's actually good. Both. To an extent, <laughs> because people feel confident that they can repay, right? And they're buying goods when they put stuff on their credit card, or they go to Lowe's and, and buy new appliances and stuff like that. So you don't, you don't want it to be extremely high, but you like to see that kind of shows consumer confidence, okay? Um, income is growing and spending not so much. So people are, 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 their incomes are growing, but their spending as a relationship isn't um, going up as much. Um, housing has improved, but we haven't fully recovered yet from the 2008, 2009, you know, fall off. What happened in 2008, 2009? Oil, Oil interest rates, the market, every, lots of things took yeah, place we'll during that time. Down. So we had this huge drop off. We haven't fully recovered from that, and we've kind of, as a company, like, this is national numbers, right? Um, we've kind of hit a recent stall, and they keep blaming the recent stall on inventory. <coughs> Overall, United States inventory of homes is at record lows. There's more buyers than sellers, mm -hmm. and so it's kind of stalled the market to an extent. And then finally, household net worth is up. It surpassed $100 trillion in the first quarter of 2018. Now, I kind of asked earlier who lived in East Montgomery County when we looked at that 20% increase in your uh, median price point. Does that make you feel wealthier? No. It does, right? I mean, you know, I bought my house for 200000 now it's worth 240000 Do I feel wealthier? Did my debt go up during that time on the house? No, it probably went down a little bit, right? So you kind of have this balance sheet wealth that makes me feel like, oh, I'm doing pretty good here, right? But it doesn't really show up until you actually spend, until you sell that product or do it. But household net worth is up. It's up over $100 trillion, which is an all-time high. So then I have some numbers here for the Texas market. <laughs> So, you know, 2000-2015 was kind of the oil decline as far as the economy. That's what we call the down years. Uh, 2017 was a recovery year. It was a very good year, even though here in Houston we had our, um, our and along the Gulf Coast, uh, Beaumont, uh, Rockport, Houston, of course, had um, its struggles as far as housing. It still was a very good year. And 2018 is going to end up showing up better uh, as far as 2017. And 2019, as far as the Texas economy, we're not talking about housing, we're talking about overall economy. Um, Dr. Gaines said there's going to be some headwinds, but it could be better than 2018. So far, there's been 367,000 job growth in Texas. That's a lot of people. They're predicting close to 400,000 people will move to Texas this year. And on his slide, he had it broken down, but that was close to like 100 people a day. God, that's a lot of people, right? So, and the other thing he did is he did a study based on, are all those people, what are they coming for? Well, they were all good paying jobs, most in the $80,000 price point and higher as far as the jobs that they were getting. Can those people buy houses making over $80,000 a year? Yes. Absolutely. That's over 1,000. 1,000 people a day. Thank you. I went to 8,000 people. <laughs> 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 All right. Maybe it was 10 people a, a, a minute. Or I don't know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Out of the top 50 counties that grew, um, that were the top growth in the United States this past uh, year, eight of them are from Texas. So over half the counties that had top growth in the United States were Texas counties. And if you went to the top 20, there were three more. So it's pretty cool. Um, the Austin MSA, which is the Austin area, not just the city of Austin, but that includes 
Cedar Park and Round Rock and Pflugerville. Lake, yeah, Pflugerville, Lake Travis, all that Austin MSA is now bigger than Cleveland's MSA. So maybe the Cleveland Browns will move to Austin. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> there's, already a, there's already a protein there. <laughs> so now we know why LeBron loved Cleveland. So. All right. 60% uh, of sales are in the 100000 to 300000 price point for Texas. So that kind of sweet spot for us as far as home sales is in that. But that's a problem because for new home builders, it's hard to build in urban areas for less than 300000 I mean, have you seen a shift over the last 18 months in builders and the, and the homes that they're building? Well, it's been longer than 18 months. Well, you know, they kind of... You know, when the Groves opened, what was the uh, the starting price point of the Groves when it first opened? 300. High 300s, I think. Yeah. Right? And are they offering some less than that now? Yes. Yeah. So the builders have kind of gotten smart going, all right, we, we, we thought that there was going to be this huge opportunity for $350,000, $450,000 new homes. And although there's still a market for that, the sweet spot is in that less than $300,000 price point. For a lot of builders, that's tough as far as the development cost, especially as you get closer to the city. So that's why we're seeing some wonderful growth, you know, out here. I drive Sorters Road, you know, to kind of get out of Kingwood and up to 1314. And there's a KB Homes community that's been kind of built back there that built, and I mean, it had to sell out in 12 months. Well, they have now cleared the entire other half of Sorters Road on the West side of Sorters Road to basically duplicate it. And all those homes are in that, you know, 225 to maybe 325 range. Very nice. So, for for yeah. price. so um, that's going to be a, a hot market um, in the next coming years. Um, so, you know, that's where I would focus if I were you, is in that 325 to 225 uh, price point. So, I think that was it. Oh, right here. This is another kind of interesting tidbit. In 1970, 80% of households were married. Today, it's less than, it's in the 40% range. Um, now, it still means that there's still people coupling up. <laughs> but they're not getting married. And I have one of them. And he hadn't coupled yet. I'm kind of looking for that person. But, or, or, you know, it's um, the millennials uh, are, are buying but they're not necessarily feeling the, the pressure to get married in order to buy. So a lot of people are buying, um, you know, even though they're not married. So don't forget that. Guy. All right, good information? Yes. So I will put all these charts on KW Connect for you, so have access to them if you want to pull them down um, and take them, you know, you're print them out in color yourself and take them to presentations, uh, either a list of presentation or a fire presentation, um, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we have gone over, but just a few things that I want to kind of uh, remind you of. Uh, Thirty-six twelve three is up and running. They had their first week last week. We have over 20 people in the room. Um, if you didn't make it and you still want to join, you still could, as long as um, you show up tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. It's $160 for the rest of the sessions. Um, and Jenny's done a, a great job. How many were in 36 12 3 last week? What did you think? Good. It's awesome. Yeah. And we have also opened up registration for... Bold, and next Tuesday we're going to be talking more about that. Uh, Bold is launching on October 10th. 10th at the Overlook, so it's easy to get to, very convenient. Um, the first step is free. Um, if you're ready to sign up for all of them, the link for that is available too. Uh, we have a reimbursement program we'll be talking about more next week, but if you want to know more information about that, um, grab Matt or I. We'd be happy to share that information with you. Uh, for those that didn't get a chance to meet Jason last week, he came back this morning. Uh, Jason Gracie is morning. going to be officially on board uh, next Monday, so we're excited to have Jason here again this morning. you have anything you want to say? I do. Uh, I'm excited to, uh, to start to work with the Keller Williams Northeast family. So I'm taking polls, the Northeast, Kingwood, what do we like to call ourselves, mainly Northeast, is this yes. right? Okay, that's what I'm hearing. Okay, so I'll end that question. Uh, very excited to get started. Uh, thank you for sharing all those numbers. We definitely like it when they go up. And I'm looking forward to working with the, uh, the staff and leadership here and everyone that's in this room and, and all the agents here to make sure that those uh, continue to go up for us uh, as, a, as a group. So looking forward to it. So again, my name's Jason. So I'm one name and you're about 270 names, so work with me on the names <laughs> as I get acclimated and I'm very excited to, to get to know each and every one of you a little bit more.
Great. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, guys. Thank uh, just a final reminder, we are still in the midst of our random acts of kindness um, time, where we're kind of making that a top of mind. Can I perform a random act of kindness for somebody? Did I witness a random act of kindness? Um, it's just that time of the year that we like to spend some time thinking about that. If you've got some, a story to share or something you'd like uh, for people to know about anonymously, um, next to my office there's a little piece of paper and a treasure box. Just write it down and slip it in there. And then at our uh, event that we're having, is that this Friday? Oh my goodness. This Friday, we're having ice cream this Friday afternoon to celebrate. Uh, random acts of kindness, and uh, we also celebrate Judy's birthday. Her birthday is actually Thursday the 13th, um, so we like to, to recognize random acts of kindness.